Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Jelasi, uh, bienvenue tout le monde. My name is Richard Eisner. I'm the Associate Vice President Research and Graduate Studies here at St. of X and Interim Director of the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government. I'd like to welcome all of our guests joining us uh, by live stream uh, this evening uh, for the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government Distinguished Speaker Series. I would like to begin this evening's program with a territorial land acknowledgement. St. Francis Xavier University stands on the lands of the of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded home of the Mi'kmaq. We express our deep gratitude and appreciation to the generations of Mi'kmaq who, since time immemorial, have loved and stewarded these lands and the beings who call them home. Colonization is not just history, it exists in the present tense. While we strive to decolonize ourselves and our institution, we know there is still much for us to learn. We are committed to doing the hard work of self-reflection and to repairing relationships with the Mi'kmaq on whose lands we reside. This includes embracing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and embodying their spirit in our day-to-day -day lives. We are all treaty people. The Brian Mulroney Institute of Government is honored to welcome renowned historian and journalist, Dr. Gwen Dyer, as part of its Distinguished Speaker Series this evening. Dr. Dyer has published numerous books, including After Iraq in 2008, Climate Wars in 2009, and War, which he published in a revised edition in 2016. His articles are widely syndicated and widely read around the globe. He has served in the Canadian, British, and United States navies. He holds a, a PhD from the University of London and served on the Board of Governors of the Royal Military College of Canada. In 2010, Dr. Dyer was named an Officer of the Order of Canada. The title of Dr. Dyer's talk this evening is War in the 21st Century, and the Q&A session at the end of the talk will be moderated by Dr. Jim Bickerton, Chair of the Political Science Department. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gwyn Dyer, and great to have you back at St. Francis. Well, thank you. I have been a busy boy, haven't I? Um, okay. I'll tell you how I'm going to organize this evening, in my own mind at least. Um, I will begin by talking about the war in Ukraine, because it's much in everybody's mind and it could get far too interesting. Um, I will then sort of put that on a hook and not get into what I think is going to happen in the future there, um, but rather go into a different kind of discussion about war everything from where does it come from and why do we do it to are we making any progress in not doing it this will not be heavily philosophical i promise you and then i will come back at the end to talk about where the immediate future lies in ukraine but more widely in the world as affected by potential outcomes different outcomes in ukraine and this will all take about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, which leaves us ample time to argue about it afterwards. But I'm actually going to start because I, I've been writing a lot about Ukraine, as you would expect, um, by emphasizing the sheer unpredictability of war. It is even harder to predict than the outcome of a hockey game. And I've had a great deal of failure in that. Um, I, was, I, just, I, was, I was reading somebody's blog the other day and they pointed out that it was entirely possible that Hitler could have lost the war in 1939 and there would have been no Second World War because when he went to war with Poland, he took practically the whole German army with him, leaving about two divisions on the French border. 
and the French mobilized, but they didn't know that. And so they didn't march into Germany with almost no opposition, taking all the major cities of West Germany, depriving the, the Germans, even if they didn't fall apart at that point, of most of their resources, industry, and so on. They didn't know, so they didn't do it. And the Germans took a month to conquer Poland, and then they sent most of their army back to the French border. There could have been no Second World War. Hitler gone by October, November of 1939. Or, other way around, 1940. The Germans overran France, drove the British off the continent, almost invaded Britain, Battle of Britain, all that stuff. But in fact, the Germans were outnumbered by the British and French. They had better tanks and twice as many of them. They had the Maginot Line, which meant there was only one way the Germans could attack, which is going around through Belgium. And they knew that that's where they were going to go and they could have stopped them there. And one guy called Guderian had a plan which was actually harebrained. If this works, we win. If it, if it doesn't work, we're screwed forever. And away he got the permission to do it, for, went through the Ardennes, ended up behind all of the allies who had advanced into Belgium. And so a less well-led on the whole, smaller army, less well-equipped, overcame the British and French armies, Dunkirk, and the collapse of France. So the Second World War could have ended in 1940 in a different way if the French hadn't, fought, hadn't again, had, had known what was coming and responded to it as, frankly, most people would have. The problem with the French in 1940 was they didn't trust their communications not to be read by the Germans, so they used carrier pigeons for important messages. So they were always a day behind the curve, and the Germans were moving fast. Okay, that's history, but the point is, similar outcomes are possible in any war at any time. There are too many moving parts to accurately predict the outcome. You're dealing with probabilities, but you can't even calculate how, what the probabilities are in, you know, sort of ranking or percentages or whatever. So, here's what I think is going on in Ukraine. And the, the, the older the news is, the, uh, the, the, the more reliable it is. But today's news is not reliable at all. Ukraine could have gone under in the first week. Since 2014, when the Russians took Crimea and the eastern provinces, Donetsk and Luhansk, in 2014, the Western powers, basically NATO countries, including Canada, have had troops in Ukraine training the Ukrainians, who, frankly, whose army in 2014 could not have taken on Luxembourg with success. So they, they began training them, and they did a good job of training soldiers, but training them to do guerrilla warfare, because they expected the Russians to overrun Ukraine if they ever invaded uh, the rest of Ukraine. They'd already taken some. Uh, the Ukrainians are not equipped to fight these people. They're outnumbered, their equipment's old, and they simply too divided among themselves. So what we'll do is we'll train a cadre of soldiers to fight a guerrilla war after the Russians have occupied it, made it very expensive for them. And right down to the beginning of the war in February last, that was the NATO strategy. In fact, in the week before the Russian, Germans, uh, the Russians invaded, which was 24th of February, the Americans pulled their embassy out of Kiev and most other Western countries did too, including ourselves and pulled all of the NATO trainers. There were not, no NATO troops or indeed diplomats in Ukraine, or at least in Kiev, no, no soldiers in Ukraine when the Russians invaded. Because everybody expected the Russians to, it wasn't just Putin dreaming in technicolor, I can do this. NATO thought he could do it. 
And uh, so it turned on a dime on the 24th. The American ambassador was gone. They sent a message to Zelensky saying, we can get you out. Take your family and whoever else you want. You'll probably want to get some other people out as well, government in exile. We'll send in choppers. We'll even give them an escort. You won't get shot down on the way out. And Putin made his famous response. I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. And I would say those seven words turned it. Now, the man is an actor, right? He's a comedian. He's, you know, he starred in movies. He knows how to play a public. He didn't just come to him. He probably thought it up the night before. But the thing was, there were enough people in Ukraine who would resist if they believed resistance wasn't a totally futile, futile enterprise. And by saying that and staying, he per persuaded enough Ukrainians it was worth the risk to remain and to fight. Could have gone the other way. I mean, if he'd been down with COVID that day, it could have gone the other way. So always you're dealing with uncertainty. War is the province of uncertainty, as Napoleon remarked. So after that, we have a period of about six months when the Ukrainians are hanging on by their fingernails, frankly. And they're helped enormously by the fact that the Russian army is vastly less well trained or equipped than we thought it was. Um, I spent a lot of time in the old Soviet Union and in the early days of the Russian Republic Federation. Um, because that was interesting journalistic territory at that time. And uh, I haven't been back all that much recently, though I suppose I'm there every couple of years. But I did notice a steady decline in efficiency, a steady rise in corruption, a steady rise in the public in cynicism, long before, well, not long before Putin came to, came to power, but from about 93 on. And it has eaten away, as it does in many countries, at the things that used to work. You can find countries all over Asia, Latin America, Africa. You can find countries in Europe where there once was a reasonably competent state, and now the state is basically a way for its owners and so-called employees to get rich. And so the corruption continues. The famous example everybody uses of what happened to the Russian army is that the Russian army back in about 2005 decided that its transport vehicles, the big trucks, which have to go off road, you're in an army, you can't stay on paved roads, needed new good 60,000 bucks a tire tires for their vehicles. Because if you want good ones, that's what you'll pay for tires this tall and that wide. And uh, you'll need 10 of them per truck for small trucks. So those tires were bought but there was a Chinese firm making cheap knockoffs. It looked exactly the same. They had even copied the Russian trade name. You find this happens a lot with luxury goods, but it happens with big truck tires too, apparently. And so enterprising people in the, the middle to high ranks of the Russian army decided that the other trucks, were, the other tires would look just as well on the trucks and they cost less than half as much, and the difference is mine. So all those tires were exchanged for cheap Chinese ones that looked just the same, 
but disintegrated about the fourth or fifth day if you tried to take them off road. You remember that famous, uh, if you were watching the news, the famous 40 kilometer queue on the road trying to, coming down out of Belarus, which the Russians were using to invade, trying to get to Kiev. The convoy is coming 40 miles, not the miles, not kilometers, it was, I think, um, of trucks. And then they're all stalled on the road for two weeks. Now, it's only a three hour drive on the freeway from the border to Kiev. But they had to go off road, and it was March by then, and March is the Rasputitsa, the mud season. And the tires all disintegrated, fell right off the rims. That's why that convoy of trucks, a couple of thousand of them, just sat there. The drivers eventually abandoned them because they had to go and find food somewhere. So it was a combination of a very competent leadership in Ukraine and some training, though not exactly for what they were going to have to do eventually, but they were trained pretty well for the kind of guerrilla resistance. They weren't guerrillas because the country hadn't been conquered. They were the country's army, but they were fighting against large numbers of better armed people. And so it was like a guerrilla war, which they had been trained for. And they did very well for, for between February and July. The Russians took more territory, but they did pull out of the stuff around the areas around Kiev and Kharkiv, the big cities, because they were so stuck they couldn't really move. And then there's a summer lull. What's happening during the summer lull? Well, first of all, some Western weapons are beginning to flow in. Now, this is a troubled issue because we have been keeping the Ukrainians on a very short leash. If you look at the weapons we send to the Ukrainians, they were initially the least offensive of offensive weapons you could imagine. I mean, we were sending them supplies, we were sending them gas masks and boots and helmets and automatic rifles and light machine guns and jeeps and what have you. <clears throat> Nothing that could really do much damage to the Russians, but showing that we were supporting them and we were giving them lots of money because of course half their economy shut down. 4 million refugees across the borders into Western European countries, another 2 million in the army. There's only 40 million of them. What do you think happens? And this is even before the Russians are bombing the cities, but the, the economy is folding up. So huge amounts of money, some arms, but a very strict rule on how you can't give them tanks, you can't give them combat aircraft, you can't give them long range artillery, you can, can't give many of the things they really need because we're trying not to provoke the Russians. Now this can get very tricky because actually we mustn't provoke the Russians so much that they go crazy and use nuclear weapons because then there's a risk everybody dies and even Ukraine ain't worth that, not even to Ukrainians. So now, how do you know where the red line is? The Russians draw red lines in the dirt every week, except they move a little bit back over time. Um, but at some point, you might find a red line that they really meant, and you don't want to go past that unknowing. And so there's enormous caution about what do we give them next? They're doing better now, but should we really give them, oh, I don't know, long-range artillery? They're running out of the old Russian stuff anyway, and, and uh, the stuff that was in other former communist countries with it has already been given to them. They have no artillery ammunition left, and besides the Russians outnumber them about 10 to 1 in artillery pieces, only 3.5 to 1 in people, but a lot more in artillery. Should we give them some American artillery? Right through July, that was debated. I mean, just artillery. Where's the red line? We want to help them. We certainly don't want them to go under, but we mustn't go so far that the Russians spin out. 
So it's not been demand feed. It's been very cautiously doled out, okay, you can have some better weapons. Here you are, about 10 of them. And uh, we don't, we, we're not going to start training anybody for these weapons until we announce that we're going to give them to you. So that'll be another couple of months before you get them on the field. And the Russians will get used to it. You know, they've got them. We just haven't seen them yet. Oh, look, there they are. Oh, they're shooting at us. You know, but in over two months, there's no red line. You walk across it on tiptoe at night, making no noise. We're still doing that. We're still, I mean, if you look at the, the news this week, the British, and sorry, the French and the Germans and the Americans all together within a, a supposedly independent national decisions, but all within the same 48 hour period, announced that they would be giving light armored vehicles, only with wheels, not with tracks, to the Ukrainians. And everybody cheered because that's something, that was a door they hadn't opened for the last 10 months and now it's open. What's the next thing? Nine, well, five, you know, one, one gets you five that it is going to be actual main battle tanks, which have tracks and are very much more dangerous and definitely would outclass anything comparable that the Russians have in the field. But for now, little ones, wheels only, small cannon, better than what they've got now, but it's being doled out very carefully with one eye on the Russians all the time. What will the Russians do if we give them this? They need it. Clearly, at every stage of this process, though it's never said on the news, more Ukrainians are dying because they haven't got the right kit. I mean, this is a fact. And frankly, I hope everybody in Ottawa and Washington and London and Paris and Berlin knows that. I suspect they do. Yeah, but they're walking a tightrope. You know, on the one hand, we should do this. On the other hand, we really don't want to fall off into a nuclear war. What will the Russians do if we give them this? That's the game that's being played. The, Ru the Ukrainians actually did a remarkable job in the period between March and, let's say, August, of taking their high command, their general staff, and some of them had been given education in this area, but given them an education on how to actually command an army that's on the offensive, not bunches of people fighting little guerrilla wars, hiding in the woods in between, but complicated, you know, they've got tanks and, and artillery and air power and missiles and all the rest of it, and you gotta put all that together and they're moving fast. How do you command that? And that's, that's a whole, there's a whole institution in this country and every other country with an army teaching people year-long courses on how to do that. It's called, you know, the general staff courses. That's what, the one in Canada's in Kingston. And they actually send army officers mid-career there for a, a year to learn how to run combined force operations. So the Ukrainians did this at a very rapid pace in about six months. They were not being given that instruction when NATO was in there previously teaching them how to do guerrilla war. And they did their first major operation in September. It was brilliant. I don't know if you recall, things come and go so fast. But basically, they moved their forces so it looked like they were going to go after that southern city on the big river, the Dnipro, called the southern city called Kherson. And the Russians moved their forces down there to counter that. And then the Ukrainians struck at the absolute opposite end of the thousand mile front or a thousand kilometer front up in the Northeast. And they went through the Russians like a knife through butter because the Russians had left, you know, it was a quiet front, not a lot of people up there. It's not tremendously important, but it's quite close to, to Kharkiv. In fact, most of it is in Kharkiv province, not the city itself, but, um, and they had reservists and worn out battalions that had taken half their casualties and they need some rest and you know, recovery and we'll feed in some replacements and all that. That's what they had up there. And 
while the Ukrainians were pre preparing or looking like they were preparing an attack down southwest, they hit the northeast. And they advanced 60 kilometers in about four days. Well, I can drive 60 kilometers in an hour, but in a war, that's pretty impressive. And then they had the wit to stop before they got too far ahead of their supply lines, which is what usually happens when offensives go too well, is you outrun your supplies and you have to retreat again. They didn't, they got it right. So they had that in uh, September. And then they um, started hitting Russian targets like ships in October. And then in November, they starved the Russians or sort of besieged and drove the Russians out of Kherson. It wasn't a battle. They just used the artillery the Americans were now giving them and drove the Russians back into the city. And then there's 60,000 Russians there. They're on the wrong side of that river. All your other forces are on the east, on the eastern side of the river. Are you sure you want to leave them there and let the Ukrainians starve them out in a siege? And the Russians actually did take, get the message and pull them all out. So it was a sort of nonviolent liberation. And so they are on a high. They are now very confident. They think that they can do it again. I think they can do it again, although I'm probably less confident than they are, because always in my mind is every, it can always go the other way. This is war. But um, I would say it is about 90% probable that there will be a Ukrainian offensive in the next month or so. I can't tell you where it'll be because they're playing this game as they should, which is bluff and double bluff. You don't want the Russians lining up behind the bit of the front. You are going to attack, distract them, draw them away. But in terms of weather and timing, this is the right time. I've actually been watching the um, <coughs> weather reports. Is this mine? Thank you. Every day for you, Eastern Ukraine, <coughs> because it's been a very late winter. There was almost nowhere in Ukraine that was below zero, even at night for more than two consecutive nights, right through December. That means the roads will turn to mud if you take vehicles off road. <coughs> it means nothing is frozen over. You, you know, the streams that will be frozen and you can drive a vehicle across them and normally in the winter haven't frozen yet. You don't want to try an offensive in, this, in these conditions. So the Ukrainians have been waiting. And as time gets shorter, it leaves them less time where the winter, hard winter freeze will actually make movement by tracked and wheeled vehicles off-road possible. But that is what they're waiting for. And they will try a proper offensive, preferably on a part of the front that doesn't have a lot of Russians on it. A thousand kilometers, you can't stack them up everywhere. And it doesn't really matter which bit of the front of it it is if they grab territory, because it's not about the economy and it's not about some grand strategy of luring the Russians into a final victorious battle. No, it's just about taking some more territory so you degrade the Russian army's morale a bit more and kill a lot more of its people, and you persuade your supporters in the West that you're still in the game. So you don't have to go for the hard target. You can go anywhere that'll give you 30 miles of advance and call it a victory. And that's what we're probably going to see in, it could be as late as early as late this month, early to late next month, at which point the year will be a year, the war will be a year old. So that's what I can tell you. I think the next thing the Ukrainians will get, will get is main battle tanks, some from Canada possibly. We don't have many left, but we have no reason to have them anymore. 
I mean, we got them for Afghanistan and that's over. Um, we've got about, is it 90? I can't remember exactly, but about that. And frankly, you could sell them all off or give them to the Ukrainians and you know, take credit for it. Um, there's about 2,000 um, German tanks um, sculling around Europe. Um, the, the, uh, the bulk of them in German hands, but practically every European country's got some. Um, and then there's some British main battle tanks, which are also likely to be offer offered. But they are not going to be in Ukraine, and the crews for them are not going to be trained in time for any winter offensive. It will be done with what's there now. So no grand final victory, but grabbing some more land back and creating a sense of momentum which keeps your backers happy and keeps the Russians worried and trying to outguess you and see, you know, there's something, there's a noise out there, go and look. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. Darling. Um, now, I'm going to stop there, like I said, and I want to talk about war in a much broader frame. I, I've been associated with the military all my life. On my, I you know, joined the Navy when I was 16. Um, three navies count and counting, but I think I'm finished. Um, and a PhD in war studies and a television series on war and endless visits to various wars. And I must have interviewed a few hundred veterans over my career in various video productions. So I guess I know a little bit about it, but I'm really still curious about the roots. And it's very interesting in the past, I would say no more than 15 years, a lot of people have been digging away at the roots and something, well, it goes back big a bit, but the question is really, how old is war? Did we invent it? Did we invent it when we became civilized? Were we peaceful before that? Or did we inherit it even before we were hunter-gatherers? Where does it go back to? And the key discovery was made um, in Kenya in the 1970s by a then young woman called Jane Goodall who was an anthrop uh, uh, sorry, a primatologist, not an anthropologist, a primatologist studying our primate neighbors. And her particular job uh, was to live with or live as close as possible to a particular chimpanzee band to, oh, they filmed them, they followed their internal politics, their sex life, everything. And, you know, they have, chimpanzees have amazing politics and sex is a part of it. Um, and uh, she spent two or three years, they all had names and, and, you know, notes are taken every day about who ate what, who scratched whom, who gave food to whom, all the rest of it. And at the end of her second year, I think it was, she realized that her band was actually fighting a war with the next chimpanzee band over. We're talking bands are maximum 30 individuals, at least half of them below sexual maturity. So not a lot of people, or not a lot of chimpanzees, I should say, but uh, they were fighting a war. Now, chimpanzees are not well, well equipped to kill other chimpanzees. They are predators. They hunt and kill monkeys and things. They do eat meat, but they're not big time predators. 95% of their food is vegetable. Um, and frankly, it's very hard for a chimpanzee to kill another chimpanzee. They've got big jaws, but that's kind of hard. They don't have saber teeth, tooth teeth, you know, that sort of thing. It would be like me trying to bite you to death, but with a bigger mouth, if you can imagine that. Um, and um, they don't have claws. 
and they, they occasionally pick up a tree branch or something to hit the ground and show how angry they are, but they're not really equipped to kill other chimpanzees, except if they ambu ambush one on five or one, six on one, so, you know, that sort of thing, then you can kill one from the opposite band. Now, trick is, of course, chimpanzees have to forage for food, and sometimes in the forest they have to split up. You can't, six of you go at the same tree, so you, you know, spread out a bit, make calls to make sure everybody's still within reach and so on, but occasionally somebody strays a bit too far. And a band of four or five foragers from another, the neighboring band, comes along, finds one individual from band B, and attacks him and kills him. And it's done automatically. This, this is not because of any offense. It's what's done. You kill him and, you know, you pick him up and drop him. You drop rocks on him. You bite him. You kick him. You may not kill him, but you leave him dying. The kind of wounds that take a while to take you down. Well, this was astonishing stuff. I mean, we thought we were the only animal who killed their own species. We, we, when I was a kid, that's what people believed. And so the mark of Cain, right? We are bad, they are good. No, they do too. Um, and then people, you know, just be, they just looked at their own notes because it was obvious that any predator species that lives in groups but sometimes has to break up into smaller numbers does this. Lions do it. Um, uh, let me think who other, um, uh, baboons do it. Um, there's a variety of the big cats almost all do it except the solitary ones. Um, and uh, hyenas do it. So this is a, a, a primate, but also a, a mammal, mammalian behavior among predators. What would be the reason for it? Why would they do that? And the answer is, you know, there has never been for any long period of time too much food. You breed up to the carrying capacity. So most of the time, most animal groups are living at the carrying capacity, the, the, the ability to provide food for them, given the competition with their own species, other bands, and other species. So if anything goes wrong, you know, the migration rate changes and the prey doesn't come through the, the, here this year, or the climate changes slightly or something, and food shortages appear, somebody is going to die. Some groups are going to shrink. Some groups are going to go through a very hard time. And at that point, if you have been successfully picking off individuals, adult individuals of the neighboring band, this is, I mean, they're not telling us this. This is the hypothesis, the explanation. But if you've been safely pick, or successfully picking them off over a long period of time, so now they're actually down to lots of females and, 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 and uh, in, infants, but only free adults, male, fighters. And it gets really difficult out there. You can go for broke, take them down, and use their resources as, as well as yours to get through the hard times that are coming. I mean, that's the evolutionary explanation. If, if Charles Darwin had known about this, that's the explanation he would have given you. But it raises a very interesting question, which is, or actually it's almost an answer. Did we invent no war? No, of course not. All of our near relatives have been doing it for at least 5 million years. Oh, well, that changes a lot, doesn't it? I mean, it changes a whole lot because it means that all of our ancestors have done it. I mean, the, the, I, once you know that and you go looking for it, you find that there is, yes, lots of evidence of human beings killing other human beings in groups in the fossil record. You know, they find there's, there's uh, things like um, Neanderthal fossils with a, a spear point lodged between the, uh, between the ribs, you know? And somehow they managed to explain that away until Jane Goodall said, yeah, of course, you know. But did you think they didn't fight wars? And the same goes with 
um, our immediate, you know, the, the Cro-Magnon group, the modern human beings that we belong to, um, we fought wars all the time. And when the anthropologists got to the last remaining Aboriginal groups who really had no, contra no previous contra contra uh, contact with Europeans, hunter-gatherer groups, by the time there were anthropologists, which is early to mid 20th century, there weren't very many Aboriginal groups that hadn't had first contact, but there were some in the Amazon and in Papua New Guinea and parts of Northern Australia um, and a couple of other places. So they went there and of course it turned out that every Aboriginal group who was genuinely hunter-gatherers or even horticulturists who did a bit of slash and burn farming lived in groups of about a hundred, which is about the same, a little bit bigger than the, the hunter-gatherer groups before them and fought wars, fought wars all the time, as did North American hunter-gatherer groups. Well, of course they did, they're human. They inherited it. And it still made evolutionary sense in that time. So we inherited this. And the result is that we fight wars not for the reasons we tell ourselves, but because we have organized both our intellects and our societies to fight wars since forever. There is no other model, you know, not real, not full societal model. Why does, why does Canada have an army? You know, well, because the state has an army. Why does the state have an army? Well, because it might be invaded. Is anybody going to invade here? No. So why do you have an army? And the answer is because you live in a world that's organized in large groups that do not exactly resemble the hunter-gatherer groups of the past, but retain a great many of the perspectives of those groups, including a dangerous world where other groups are a threat to us and we must make alliances to be bigger than their alliances. And so everybody gets drawn in. There hasn't been a time since Canada was independent when we were not in alliances. Even though we have the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans and the Arctic Ocean as borders on three sides and the Americans on the fourth side, friendly but uh, impossible to stop if unfriendly, so what's the point? And yet we have an army. 100,000 Canadians died in war in the 20th century. So everything that we do echoes that ancestral heritage. I mean, it's not that we're slaves to the past, but we, we hardly notice it is the past because it's the present too. That is a, a recognition, a realization, which is actually gradually creeping through human society. I mean, it's, it's only 40 years old after all, 50 at most. I didn't know it myself when I was the age of the younger people here. And it is, I think, gradually transforming a critical human perspective, which is war is something that happens for present reasons. Maybe not as big as they pretend to be, but it's always, you know, it's the Ukraine and we have to stop them. No, it's not. I mean, it is, but it is also the fact that we are descended from animals who have hunted at least for five or 10 million years and fought wars with each other because they could, and it was to their evolutionary advantage, but not to ours. Not since territory ceased to be the main source of wealth. So, are we getting out of it? Well, here is a very important fact that I hardly ever hear anybody mention. It is now 77 years since any of the great powers directly fought any other of the great powers. 
You might want to think about that for a minute. It is right. I've thought it through. But it, when I, they use proxies sometimes. They certainly fight wars against smaller powers all the time. But the Americans, the British, the French, the Russians, and the, uh, the uh, Chinese, not to mention the Japanese and the Germans and the the Indians, I'm afraid, are not part of this, but they're only recently great power. Um, but for the traditional great powers and several other countries that have been in great powers in the recent past, it has been 77 years, which is a very full lifetime since anybody fought any, any other great power directly. Proxy wars, colonial wars, anti-colonial wars, all sorts of things, mismatched always. But the big guys do not fight each other anymore. Now, I'm not saying that they're doing that because they finally realize that this is an evolutionary heritage we don't need that is doing its damage, fighting wars. No. Some people have come to that realization. I think more are as time, time goes past. But the direct causes for this are both in the Second World War. Technological warfare is too destructive to serve any purpose for which a war might be fought. The, the, the cost-benefit ratio is insanely bad. And you see that playing out in the Second World War. It begins playing out in the First World War. You could even say it was playing out pretty badly by the time of the Napoleonic Wars, but not, you, you could argue about it then. You, I mean, you know, this is First World War. What in God's name was that about? 11 million dead directly. And what, can you remember what it was about? I, I mean, we lost 60,000 people and Canadians, and I can, you know, can you remember what this was about? Would it have made any difference if it had come out the other way? And then the Second World War. Very traditional. Sort of thing that the European countries, and that for the last three or four centuries meant the world, because the rest of the world had been see conquered by European countries and then became part of their empires. But, you know, for, for the... Uh, population of the world, which was about 2 billion in 1945, to lose probably around 60 million dead as a direct consequence of war is insane. That's, that is back up to the sort of traditional losses that hunter-gatherer societies had, which was 30% of adults male kills over a lifetime in war. Um, and cities, half the cities of the world bound flat. Before nuclear weapons came along, it had already been the worst catastrophe, political catastrophe, human catastrophe in the history of the human race. And then cherry on the cake, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now we can kill 100,000 with one bomb. And I think those two things, and they come in parallel, it's not just the nuclear weapons, it's the nuclear weapons and the knowledge of what major war between great powers even without nuclear weapons does that has given us 77 years of great power, non-conflict. And it's the reason we're all still here, because otherwise, frankly, a lot of us wouldn't be. At every age group. You know, it's, it's the, the unsung miracle. It's not a miracle. I mean, and I, I can tell you, I can, I can see where it comes from. It's uncelebrated, unsung. We got something right. You know, people say nuclear weapons saved us. Well, there is a side to that that is true. I, I can remember one guy I was interviewing, American, who is an author, actually, quite a well-known fellow called Paul Fussell, and he commanded troops all through France in the 1944-45 
and um, he was about to be shipped out for the uh, the, uh, the invasion of Japan at the end of '45, and then the news came in August of '45 of nuclear weapons in Japan, and the war ended. And he said, "I cried. The nuclear bomb saved my life. I knew I wasn't going to survive the second second invasion." Yeah, you know, but in general. The, the combat, a combination of the nuclear weapons and of the huge life lost. I mean, you know, 98% of those lives, 99% of those lives were not lost to nuclear weapons. But the, the combination of those two things, the 60 million dead or whatever it was. I mean, the Russian record keeping was so bad by the end that they, it was give or take 10 million, you know. Um, but the combination of those two things has given us what looks to me like a peaceful world. But then I'm a journalist. I know we always magnify what is going to fill all the space. Have you never noticed that the paper is the same size and there's always stories to fill every page of it? Right. Isn't it a miracle? We must be really clever. No, we just take the next least interesting thing and expand it to fill the space available. And even the least interesting of all violent things is more interesting to most human people than the largest thing that is nonviolent. So on the screen or in the paper or on your phone or whatever, conflict leads. If it bleeds, it leads, journalistic adage. And so you don't realize until you actually sit down and count that the toll of war is falling very dramatically in every single year, I think except one, but I, I'll have to try and remember which one that was. Since 1945, the f number of deaths in war has fallen every year. It, it has fallen from probably around 2 million a month in 1945 to way below a thousand a year in recent years. Sorry, a month, a thousand a month, around 10,000 a year. Now, Ukraine has definitely boosted those numbers back up, but it's the first war that's managed to do that since the Second World War. So something's going on. The ideas are changing and the weapons are having an effect. And we are actually beginning to change our minds. I mean, if you want a quick snapshot, I can tell you exactly when war ceased to be glorious. It was about early 1917. Halfway through the, the, the First World War, and the media were beginning to reveal what was actually happening at the front. And the war was becoming meaningless in terms of nobody could tell you what it was about. And the young men were being taken off in Canada and in other places to a meat grinder from which many of them would return wounded and disabled for life. And around 30% wouldn't return. And suddenly war, which had always been in every human culture or almost every human culture, every large human culture, glorious, ceased to be glorious and became a problem. War became a problem for everybody who had access to mass communications in around early 1917. Never went back to not being a problem. Never went back to being glorious. So we've been working on this agenda for about a century. And we're making some progress with the assistance of nuclear weapons scaring the shit out of uh, scaring people. And uh, the death toll of the Second World War being so monstrously out of proportion to the stakes of the war. And a kind of evolution of the consciousness human consciousness, if you would accept the existence of such a strange thing. So I am not confident 
But I am a betting man, and if you ask me to put my money down, will there or will there not be a great war like the wars of the past in the next 50 years, I would actually say no. The possibility certainly exists. The weapons exist. The organizations to use the weapons exist. They will continue to exist in some fashion for a long while. But what's in the heads of the people who own and use those weapons or who control those weapons, there are different things now. And some of those things will definitely act as a deterrent. And I haven't used that word until now, but here it comes, deterrence. When nuclear weapons were used in August of 1945, it came as a vast shock to everybody except the few hundred thousand people who are in the the seek you know, in the secret, the bomb project, the Manhattan Project, as it was known. Um, so they, nobody had a lot of time to think about that. But a bunch of young American scholars, mostly at Princeton University, um, began trying to figure out what the implications of this were. They weren't soldiers. Um, but they were interested in international politics and things like that. And they, they you know, what, what does this change? The existence of these weapons of mass destruction. And um, they labored away at it. They had a couple of meetings from no, about actually late November of, of 1945 to spring of 1946. And then they wrote the theory of deterrence, complete. There's been people tinkering with it ever since, but they got it right the first time. The outlines are still exactly the same. And the message was that these weapons are only useful to deter other people from using similar weapons on you. They must never be used to seek advantage they can only be used to deter others who would otherwise attack you. That was it. Simple, unarguable, and actually successful for 77 years. I mean, they were up to 10,000 of the things at one point, 10,000 each, the Russians and the Americans. They're down to about 3,000 now, which is still only about 20 times more than they could possibly explain why they have. Um, but, you know, for all of that time and through all the various crises and the Cuban crisis and the collapse of the Soviet Union and all the rest of it, not a single nuclear weapon used in war. Not even really a direct threat to use one, because that breaching the rules of deterrence too. This isn't bad. This is as good as you could expect it to get. I mean, given that we are descended from a thousand generations of warring hunter-gatherers, I think it's not that bad. So let's go back to Ukraine and finish off. The Ukrainians will launch an offensive, I think, this winter. Basically, they've got until about the end of March before the next rainy mud season starts, the spring Rasputitsa. So they'll grab some territory if they can, and almost anything will do to validate that they are still winning in the eyes of their supporters. Can they drive the Russians out of Ukraine, which is what they declare that they want to do and will do? Well, it is interesting that while the Americans say things like, we support the Ukrainians and they make their choices as to their goals, the Americans have never said, we support the liberation of all the territory of Ukraine. Not once. Doesn't happen. It's like the, the, you know, we don't cross these lines. 
And it's wise, I think, because if they can do it and the Americans feel that they don't for too threatened by a, a nuclear war with the Russians if the Ukrainians do do that, then let them go ahead and do it. But committing yourself to that makes you a mortal enemy of the Russians in the real world as opposed to the rhetorical world that we see every day. And it is not a vital American interest that Ukraine reconquers the Donbass. Frankly, if I was an advisor to Mr. Z uh, Mr. Zelensky, I would say that you should aim to put the borders back where they were in 2014, before the Russians grabbed Crimea and the eastern half of two eastern provinces. Not because that's just as it isn't, and you don't have to say, or we don't have to believe that that is a permanent settlement, but it is legally a peace treaty, and you will leave that, that area open to discussion or negotiation for the future, which means in practical terms, nothing will happen, because Ukraine doesn't need these things. This, the Eastern Ukraine was basically created as the Donbass, a newly industrialized area, because it had a lot of coal, a lot of, a lot of iron, and you could build a steel industry there, and there was oil later as well. All of these are sunset industries. Eastern Ukraine is an industrial museum. You know, to, ha to have it is to subsidize it for the rest of existence. So you don't, there's no practical reason, it's honor. The, the, the Ukrainians who really want to be with the Russian state and the Ukrainians who didn't want to be with the Russians, which is some Russian-speaking ones, most Russian-speaking ones, as well as the Ukrainian-speaking ones, have gone west by now, if at the latest with the rest, recent Russian invasion, but most of them after 2014. Do you really want to inherit a population of several million people who loathe and hate Ukraine as your citizens? I mean, it seems to me a, a rather quixotic uh, goal. So make a deal. Honor will not be fully satisfied, but we can write it so it looks like it's being satisfied. You will be rid of a burden you do not need. You will have a far more manageable domestic politics. And life will go on. Nobody will care in 50 years time where that border is. You know, it's just not that important. So I, you know, I think that is what the thinking is in Moscow. There's a minority view in, in, in Washington. There's a minority view in Washington that says bleed the Russians white. You know, um, and I think that's complete nonsense. The Russians are going to be there one way or another forever, just like the Americans and the British and the French are. They're always in the game. You can't deal them out. So leave them with some self-respect and at least an ability to make their way back into the good graces of the rest of the world. Don't bleed them until they expire. They won't expire. They'll just get angrier and more desperate. So, but that's a minority view in Washington. I think the majority view is this war will end. There will have to be a deal. It will not get all of Ukraine stuff back, but it will get what it needs. <coughs> Russia hopefully will change its leadership, but that's not a big deal because it could turn out the next one is, just, is, is bad, not good. He could be worse than the present one as well as better than the present Putin regime. You don't, don't try to manipulate Russian politics. It's not worth the game. Just end it. You've got, you've got the deal you want. Ukraine is not under Russian occupation. You're going to have to subsidize it enormously to keep it going for the next 10, five years anyway, because the economy is in ruins. Um, and you're going to have to subsidize it because they really will want to keep their guard up militarily, unless there's a, la a huge change in Russia. And... You know, regard this as a successful one-off experience from which we have all learned useful things. Not victory. Victory is the wrong goal. I do, I imagine an outcome, I can imagine an outcome 
where the Russian army does in 1917. In 1917, the Russian army, after three years of war, admittedly not one, simply fell apart. Simply fell apart. Privation, bad officers, bad leadership, poor food, uh, bad, you know, many very large losses. And one day or one week, they simply decided to stop fighting the Germans and headed home just in time to join a revolution. These things do happen in history. Uh, it could happen again. Hasn't happened for a long time, but it did happen in Russia uh, about 100 years ago. It could happen again, it must, you know. So I don't particularly want that to happen, honestly. Um, too much crockery broken, too, too many people hurt, too many innocent people hurt. Um, but I have no control over it, and neither do the Russians. So, in terms of wishes, I would like a deal that puts things back the way they are. Doesn't punish everybody, though, I, even including people I'd dearly love to see punished. But war is rarely in that way. World War II did, but it was a very expensive way to end a war. And uh, as for war in general, I remain optimistic. Thank you very much. Well, Jim. Thank you very much. Fantastic as usual. Uh, my role here mainly is to just help Gwen field questions from the audience. Very accustomed to doing it on his own, but I'm here to at least spy people with their hands up to help yes, you out there. So if you want to start out, I guess up in the corner, you were the first one. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for this. Very illuminating. Uh, I have a question. Um, in your opinion, then, Russia is, is a spent fighting force. That they're not going to take an offensive. And you seem to focus very much on Ukraine and their next move. Uh, with little mention of, of Russia as an offensive actor. Um, is that your opinion? I, it's not the Russians' opinion, but it's mine. Um, in the sense that um, I, they're doing what they can in terms of raising more troops, trying to give them a little more training before they throw them into the fight. Um, but they've got an awful lot operating against them. This was supposed to be a three-day surprise operation. So the, the Russians did not mobilize anybody. They went, you know, it was a come as you are war. And to make the numbers up, they took along all the experienced training cadres that would normally be left behind to train, you know, so mobilize troops if you were going into a big long war. Well, the casualties among the 180,000 Russians, all of them experienced professional soldiers, or not all, but 80%. The casualties in the initial invasion were very high and highest of all in the officer classes, with the result that they basically destroyed their training base. You know, when they mobilize people now, they don't have the equivalent of sergeants. There are no real NCOs in the Russian army, which is bizarre beyond belief. But the people who specialized in training and would normally be there to turn the next intake into soldiers don't exist. They're dead or wounded and mutilated and whatever. That cadre is gone. So that's not there to fix things, you, no matter what you do. You can conscript more soldiers. The officer corps you've got, which is eaten out with corruption, everybody's got something on everybody else. You know, that way we're all safe. You know what I mean? That, that, that kind of game. Um, makes them very bad officers. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, not an idea, I'm not at all starry-eyed about the military, but some of the functional requirements of a military officer are loyalty and honesty. It'll get you killed if you're next to one who isn't loyal and honest. He's not telling you the truth. He doesn't, it doesn't have your back. You're dead. So it's a functional requirement in an army 
that people be like that. And by and large, officers in the Russian army aren't like that. So, you know, they, you can send them back to school for a while and teach them how to do mortars or something, but it won't change who they are. They're rusted out. It's reasons like that uh, that make me very doubtful that the Russians can do a kind of comeback. In normal circumstances, of course they could. You know, I mean, you look at the old British army in the First World War was practically wiped out in late 1914. And so you had Kitchener's army, the Lord Kitchener, the, the uh, Minister of Defense at the time, basically called up a million people and they trained them all through 1915 and with new officers and using new car sergeants and all the rest of it, but took the time. But they weren't demoralized and they weren't corrupt and they were trainable and they put them in the trenches. They didn't win the war or anything, but they, they operated as well as anybody else. The British Army did not collapse. Um, a lot did in the First World War. I mean, the German army finally collapsed, the Italian army collapsed, the Russian army collapsed, the Austria-Hungarian army collapsed, and the British army, they were worried it might collapse. You know, so armies do collapse under stress. But I, and I'm not saying it will collapse, it could, but I do not think it will recover to be a fully functional army capable of carrying out a, a, a proper offensive. I could be wrong. Another, well, yeah. there's another in the back. Thank you very much, Mr. Wire. <clears throat> Actually brings back memories of being here uh, when I was an undergraduate student. We, we spoke, I think, back then as a Oh, right. Oh, I was the good looking one, wasn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Still well, there you go. Right, so. Um, I really enjoyed your, your, your lecture here. And again, this is probably the third time I've seen you over these years. Uh, I'm very hopeful of the response you had at the end of the 2014 deal. Let's hope that that's going to happen. <laughs> well, I hope so, happen. yeah. Um, uh, I guess in one sense, I'm kind of there, I mean, in the sense that it assumes that the war is only the UK Russian war, and it seems to be you know, the American interests that have been developing over the last year since the Obama administration. Um, do you think the Americans would be happy with that decision? And what is the purpose of the, the Ukraine war in, in a large respect? Is it, is it really to move American? Troops more and more into Ukraine eventually, or or you just see you think of your deal that if it did happen, the Americans would give up and go home. I think that the there is certainly a great deal of advantage to the United States in being able to have a war with Russia in which somebody else supplies all supplies all the troops. You know. It means that they get to try all their new weapons out in real battlefield conditions, but no Americans die. Um, it means that uh, the Russians are fully occupied and can't get up to any nonsense elsewhere. Um, it reorganizes re NATO into a genuine operational alliance, which it was drifting away from. <clears throat> with the Americans in prime post. I mean, from the point of view of those who want to switch to concentrating on America, this is wonderful because you don't have to worry about Europe for five years now. It's in, in your pocket. You can get on with the Asia pivot and you'll still have the, the Europeans with you. <clears throat> so all of those things. But it's not worth it to their allies and not really worth it even to the Americans themselves to keep this going forever. It's, it's handy in a number of ways, uh, politically, economically, and technologically. But, you know, a year of it is quite enough to draw most of the benefit from it that you are likely to get from it. I mean, you know, in terms of galvanizing the Europeans, in terms of trying out your new weapons, you've done it now, except the ones you didn't give the Ukrainians yet, but they don't get round to that. Um, so, no, I don't think that there is some need in the United States to keep this going. 
I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's part of the larger argument that people often make, and I never agree with, that, well, it's all to keep the arms industry going, right? You have, and the answer is no, you don't need a war to keep the arms industry going. You need the threat of war to keep the arms industry going. You don't actually have to fight wars. And I think it's, you know, you can say this of the various advantages that accrue to the Americans as a result of the Ukraine war as well. I mean, they, most of them have already accrued. And if there's a few that will continue to give benefit to the Americans as time passes, they're not big enough to keep this thing going. If other possibilities arise that where you could close it down, declare a success and not go home because you never left home, you know. So no, I don't think the Americans are gonna try to prolong it. Was that sort of the answer you were thinking? Yeah, okay. Uh, here and then here. Uh, sorry, here, here, and then here. It's raining all over. Yes. Uh, just want to start with the Syria action. Um, and I agree, I think that the solution that you're proposing is most realistic. Uh, I still think there's a few questions yeah. that are raised. I think one is would Russia, in the current state of the war, accept a uh, that sort of peace negotiation? Would that be the off ramp that they uh, have? And also, would Ukraine propose it? Ukraine would not propose it. I think the Russians might take it. And my third one is, well, let's assume that uh, the Nazi naive is so that America you know, will push for this peace. Do you think that there's anything that the NATO countries can do, perhaps uh, <clears throat> threatening supply and uh, arms to Ukraine to further negotiate? To blackmail them into it. Okay, <clears throat> if the Russian, Russians had their head screwed on frontwards, they would declare a victory and go home. They control the media with a little effort, the Russian media. There, there was a lot more information coming in before than there is now. They have really restricted information flows from outside. If the, the Russian leadership under Putin or a successor wanted to, it would be a real PR piece of work, but they could declare a victory on the frontiers of 2014 and go home. The, the, the so-called mill bloggers, the, the, uh, the Russian ultranationalists who actually have a lot of access to troops in the front and are you constantly berating the government for not supporting the troops better, would have a collective heart attack, of course. But they're not independently powerful factions, they're individuals. And at the very worst, they could have traffic accidents or be caught, you know, <laughs> naked with the wrong person or something like that. This, these are fixable things and there's always poison if that doesn't work. Um, so I think that a post-Putin leader or even Putin with a change of mind, which is less likely, I don't know whether, what his health is like. The guy just turned 70. You can be very fit at 70 or drooly, you know. Um, and, I, and I don't know which it is. He's clearly in a lot of pain. Just look at the way he clutches his desk all the time. But that could be many, many different things. Um, so um, from the Russian perspective, it's a possible outcome. It is not an acceptable outcome for, the, for Ukraine at the moment. In fact, Putin, uh, sorry, excuse me, Zelensky has said that there would have to be a referendum in Ukraine on an EP settlement, which is a very hard thing to unsay once you've said it politically. And there is no, the public opinion in Ukraine with continual small victories boosting morale is no mood to say, oh yeah, let's go back to not 2014 borders now. But 
Yes, you're right. There could be pressure from both the Germans and the Americans, less so from other NATO members. But, you know, there are realists in positions of power in most capitals. That's how you get into positions of power, is by being a realist. With exceptions, Mr. Mr. Trump and so on, but, you know, generally. So uh, I think that uh, if... It would be a really difficult job for the Ukraine for the Ukrainians on their own of their own accord to agree to the kind of peace that would be acceptable to the Russians if the Russians decided that back to 2014 borders is an acceptable outcome. It would require pressure from outside. Of course, the Ukrainians would play the Western media like a violin. They already do. So there would be a propaganda war here with many people defending the Ukraine's right to fight all the way back to the 2014 frontiers. I don't know who would win that fight, but it is conceivable, particularly if the Ukrainians don't keep winning, which is another possible outcome. Um, don't lose, but don't keep winning every other you know, advance every couple of months. Then after a while, that wears you down. Then, then there is a negotiated settlement possible, and I don't think the United States would or could block it. There's no point in making enemies where you've got friends. The military mind interrogate all the possibilities. Your question. Dr. Dyer, thank you for being here tonight in spite of our inhospitable weather. I was amazed they canceled the school. I was supposed to speak in your, your, your school here this morning. They canceled it. We're a tougher crowd tonight. I'm a Newfoundlander, man. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of defense, uh, you've spoken, and I think most acknowledge that uh, for the past 77, going on 78 years, nuclear deterrence has certainly worked amongst the superpowers. But today we're faced with, let's say, middle powers. We're driven by ideology, by religion, the Iraqs, the Israelis, the North Koreans. How do you see that fitting as we go forward? With India and Pakistan is what I worry about, <clears throat> not the others. Okay. I don't think the, <clears throat> sorry. I don't think the uh, Israelis are crazy enough to attack Iran without American backing. And particularly this Israeli government, which is profoundly unpopular in Washington, I mean, the new Netanyahu government, um, would not have American backing on such a harebrained enterprise. It's far too late to imagine that bombing Iran is going to eliminate all its nuclear facilities. I mean, they've been digging them in underground even while as they've been, and it's not, it's not illegal to dig them in underground. But I mean, you can't do a surprise attack and take them all away. It doesn't work. So I don't worry about that one. And I, I mean, obviously the Iranians, if they did have one, it would be for deterring Israelis, not for a suicide one, one nuke attack on Israel whereupon 200 nuclear weapons from Israel land on Iran, you know, no. So that one doesn't bother me. That's effective deterrence. Uh, I don't worry about North Korea, because obviously what they're into is getting some deterrence against the United States. Again, a suicide mission to use those weapons, but a few of them able to reach the United States are enough to make the Americans not threaten to use nukes on North Korea. I mean, that's the third generation now of Kim's who has understood that. It is ingrained knowledge. Um, but India and Pakistan both started building nuclear weapons a long time ago, went popular, public with nuclear tests in 1999, have continued to build ever since, and are still in the, well, what the, the nuclear strategy people call the use them or lose them dilemma, which is their nuclear weapons are on rockets and airplanes that are above ground on airfields, maybe in blast shelters, but really vulnerable to a first attack. So if you think a first attack is coming, you better get them off the ground now or you're going to lose them. Use them or lose them. 
that is the classic nuclear dilemma, which is only solved by putting them somewhere that they can't be destroyed by the enemy in a surprise attack, which for practical mean, uh, practical purposes, mostly means in submarines. And as people get nuclear weapons, the very next thing they start working on, the Indians are working on it now, the Pakistanis I think are starting to, is to get nuclear weapons to put, uh, get submarines to put those nuclear weapons in so you can send them out to sea and you're no longer in a fire on a launch on warning posture. You can stop and see, especially if you are only six minutes flight time from the other side's capital city, which both of them are. You know, so um, that's the one I worry about. And I worry about it doubly because a, a bunch of people whom I know actually, they're climate scientists and I've been dealing with them on these matters, did a study about the impact of a Pakistani-Indian nuclear war of let's say 100 warheads each. They've got twice that now. Now, you may recall talk in the late 80s of a nuclear winter. If, if the Russians and the Americans launched all their nuclear weapons, and a lot of them hit cities. The cities would burn and what you would have would be hundreds of firestorms putting soot up into the stratosphere. And that would bring a nuclear winter that would block out enough sunlight to drop the temperature 10 degrees on the coasts and 20 degrees in the middle of continents at any season, which means frost at almost any season, crops dying, people starving, all that. And this came out right at the end of the Cold War. Uh, Carl Sagan and that piece, it was involved in it. And uh, so we digested that. And since there hasn't been much in the way of threats of Russian-American wars since then, uh, it's sort of retreated into the background. But what they did, this group, mostly at Rutgers University, um, was to uh, make, make the same kind of models of what the fallout would be if there was an, an, an Indo-Pak nuclear war that struck cities. And now there's a hundred cities burning in India and in Pakistan each. What would that do? It's not a thousand anymore, but what would a hundred cities put boosting and their, their, their cities that will burn really well? I mean, if you know what subcontinental cities are like, they're the most combustible pieces of work you ever saw. So, what would happen with that? And they worked it out. And the answer is that most of the major agricultural breadbaskets of the planet would be in the worst dark. It wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't be darkness at noon like the big nuclear winter. It would be light frost and, and overcast all the time right through the growing season for three or four years in the major breadbaskets. So you're talking about a complete lack, a complete cessation of international trade. No company, country has enough food it can afford to export any. And famines in those who do not have very adequate, more than adequate agricultural resources in areas where you were nearer the sea. Forget the interior of the continents. You're not going to get anything out of there. Forget the American Midwest, you know, the North German plain. You need to be near the sea so that it's only 10 degrees colder, not 20. Uh, so uh, that's one to worry about, and completely beyond our control. So there you uh, are. Question there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the great talk. That's always five in the last twenty years. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, um, I mean, you've been to Russia more than almost any Russian I've been there a lot. Yeah. yeah. What is the chance that the ethnic well, the ethnic republics are far fewer than they used to be, of course. Um, basically, um, the remaining ethnic republics are mostly parts of the Russian Federation where the eth ethnic groups are large minorities or small majorities. I'm talking about Kazan, and you know, sort of internal, have been in Russia since the, oh, 15th, 16th century, not recent acquisitions of the Russian Empire in the 19th century. Um, 
and there are people who speak, they're bilingual in, you know, Turkey and, and, and Russian, things like that. Um, they really don't want to leave all that much. And uh, in any case, geographically, they're surrounded by Russian speaking areas. They're not going to be able to leave. The Caucasus is, is, of course, different, small, you know, Chechnya, but a couple of others as well. Um, but frankly, if they did leave, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. You know, they might be happier, but they wouldn't be richer, and the Russians might be sadder, but they wouldn't be poorer. Um, so, uh, it, you know, people talk about Russia breaking up. Most of Russia's present territory, 90% of it, is overwhelming majority Russian. Why would they break up? You know, this doesn't make sense. There's areas, the, the, the trickiest area is actually northern Kazakhstan, because the northern agricultural belt of Kazakhstan, which is a very big country in its own right, is still Russian majority. It was settled mainly in the Khrushchev years in the 50s to grow wheat. That's when the Caspian Sea dried up, right? Um, that band there is, is very Russian. And uh, it's quite happy because they're doing well. They're actually better off than their Russian, their Russian Federation neighbors. But apart from that, I can't see any large part of the Russia or its former parts that would desperately want to change the allegiance. Uh, people talk about it. They particularly, I mean, it's part of Russian propaganda. They want to break Russia up. Don't be silly. I mean, don't be silly. That's nonsense. It's too late. You know, the Mongols could have done it, but, you know, there's a lot of history since then. Yeah, uh, yeah, you were head your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. I have a question concerning, so I guess you described that there's a transformation happening where we're becoming more critical of our, maybe our propensity to go to war. Yeah. And maybe worse. And I wonder if our previous opinion that perhaps considerations for power and how like the shifting of power to make war, like viewing that as maybe anachronistic or just irrelevant, could that have maybe led Ukraine down a bit of a similar path to where they provoked their attack? And of course, like the blame was on Vladimir in Ukraine, but there is an argument maybe that like Russia, maybe Russia felt like their sovereignty was being challenged by like Western expansion eastward. Well, there's, there's about three ways to answer this question, but there's short ways, I promise. One, a guy, a Polish guy I had known from the heroic years of the, you know, sort of the, uh, the end of communist rule, I ran into in Warsaw much more recently. Not before, not before the Ukraine war, but after uh, the Russians started campaigning that Russia was encroaching, uh, that NATO was encroaching on Russian territory and all that stuff. And he said, you know what would have happened if we, had, if you, if um, uh, Poland and the other former satellites had not been allowed to join NATO? I said, no, what? He said, we'd all have nuclear weapons by now. Certainly Poland would. I mean, if you look at the history of Poland's relations with Russia, including being disappeared entirely for almost two centuries, but also very recent history of being occupied by the Russians, everything from the, 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 sort of the siege of Warsaw, Warsaw in 44 to down to the last communist ruler of, of, of Poland, they're not going to leave themselves vulnerable to the Russians. If they didn't have NATO's nukes, they'd have their own nukes, and they're big enough to do it, you know? So, and I don't want Polish people sitting on the Russian border with nukes, and if the, if the Russians think that's a good idea, they need their head examined. Second <clears throat> answer, <clears throat> the Russians began complaining about Western encroachments on Russian territory, sweeping aside the fact that those countries have had a bad time with you and they do have free choice, they're sovereign nations, in favor of the fake military argument that we are more endangered because now NATO's borders are on Ukraine and on Belarus 
instead of back in Germany somewhere, you know? And the answer is, this is not 1945 nor anymore, darling. It's, you know, 2022, and we've had nuclear weapons for 77 years, and tanks don't count. It doesn't matter where your damn tanks are if we're going to go to war with a nuclear weapon. <laughs> Did I do that? That's, that's wonderful. Could I do it again? No, no. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a completely false argument. Um, uh, but it's a useful argument with people who don't understand that distance doesn't matter when you've got nuclear weapons that can fly 8,000 kilometers. Yeah. You're not more threatened if I move them to 6,000 kilometers <laughs> you know? or 60. In fact, if I move them to 60, they're vulnerable. So, um, and I forget what the third reason was, but those two will do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. He has been trying a lot. Oh, yeah. He's hidden behind the screen. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Would you say about Ukrainian conflict uh, going far past what the Russians predicted, that this made um, Taiwan more secure or less secure in terms of their safety of uh, possible Chinese security? Well, I was hired to write a long essay, essay about China's, uh, uh, Taiwan's vulnerability to a Russian attack. Oh, about five months ago, six months ago. No, hang on. It was longer ago than that. Anyway, it came out four or five months ago. Um, and at that time, it seemed to me that the invasion of Ukraine and the failure of the Russians to win a clear, prompt victory would play very negatively in terms of the idea in Beijing that an invasion of Taiwan would work well. That it would force, I mean, most of the people in the Chinese leadership have no military experience, so they don't think about this a lot. And I don't know what the civil real military relations are like, but frankly, the Chinese army officer corps has very little experience of overseas expeditions either, and hasn't fought a war since 1953. So, um, you know, what kind of advice are his uh, Xi soldiers giving to Xi Jinping? I don't know, but it may have been too optimistic. And in that case, the, uh, the Ukrainian experience, it wasn't three days and it wasn't a walkover and it could kill the regime, will be considered extensively in Beijing now. When the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, went down to see the Taiwanese um, that was very prov provocative, and they did respond by just sort of putting airborne craft uh, airborne on all corners, including the sort of eastern, way from China corners of, of Taiwan. Um, but they had to do something. I mean, in, in the childish world of diplomacy, they had to do something. Bear in mind that, you know, the larger the group, the more childish the behavior. Two billion people have exactly the same responses as four-year-olds. Whereas, you know, 20 people could actually have grown-up responses at the same time. So, you know, in that sense, um, you know, you're, you're maneuvering large, dumb objects when you're talking about governments. Um, and it takes a large incident like Ukraine to get a government in another part of the world to go, oh, so if we did that, it might come out like this? You know, so I think it did have a positive effect. Yeah. 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 Hi, thanks for coming. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, <laughs> how, uh, how uh, war <laughs> happens to me. I um, has been. Yeah. Didn't say will be. Okay. Do you, do you see war as a like natural population check, like disease and famine, or do you think it's causes? I think if you go back to hunter-gatherer times and pre-human primate times, there is definitely a actual food-related, survival-related cause.
for the behavior. In a famine, who starves? Not us if we picked off enough of their guys already. Um, but that's a long, long time past. The objectives now down to the 20th century, or at least the 19th century, um, the objective was still territory, which is at all, I mean, humans are territorial. They were territorial before they were civilized. Every band has its territory and mostly sticks to the middle third of the territory so you don't get picked off alone near the borders with another band. Um, so territory was critical because that's where the resources were natural resources in this case. And then, but you know, you move into civilization and territory is the source still of wealth. And so war, if it gives you more territory and you're successful at it, makes sense. Not if you die in it, but the people who run the place mostly don't. And so, you know, down to at least 1800, I would say, for most countries, war made sense at least be good enough not to lose your territory. And if you're really good, you get lots more and that's called an empire and you live very well indeed. Not once you get into the late 19th, early 20th centuries, because already the technology is making war so destructive. And it's not just the technology of weapons, it's the technology of being able to put a million people in the field where is the biggest army ever seen before about 1500 AD was 20,000 men, you know? They couldn't feed or communicate with any more men than that. Now you can get a million men or two million men armies and there's trains to bring up the shells and all the rest of it. So you can expand the thing enormously even before nuclear weapons, and it is now incredibly expensive compared to whatever territory you might get. Most wealth is no longer coming from territory, it's coming from manufacturers or technology or even ideas. But the, the motivation is still territory. It's, there's a huge cultural lag here. But, you know, even cultural lags do eventually catch up. And I think that may be happening. It sure is, yeah, and, and it doesn't check population. The population grows steadily with, with a few little hiccups in the worst years of the, of the world wars, but nothing, they're just in blips on the graph. Mr. Stanton has a question. Yes. Uh, do you think there is a chance for Putin and Kremlin or whatever, the philosophy, the establishment to, to be held accountable for their crisis? or is ICC or any other court? Uh... Not unless Russia is occupied and they're taken prisoner. I don't see that happening. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, here. Um, so my question is about China and Russia. Yeah. The past couple months has been supporting the space and trade, offering a small bailout in the sanctions that other Western countries have put on them. Uh, how long do you think China is going to hold on to support Russia? And if China does pull out from this uh, mutual agreement, uh, uh, what impact is that going to have on Russia's effectiveness? I don't think the Chinese are helping the Russians much at all. First of all, they depend enormously on trade with precisely the countries that are fighting Russia by proxy. Um, and breaking Western sanctions on America will cause them huge amounts of trouble with much more important trading partners. So they obey the sanctions by and large. They don't enforce them themselves. Well, they don't in the sense that they don't declare sanctions on Russia, but they police their own firms to make sure that their firms are not breaking the sanctions because they don't want that trouble. I mean, especially now when the economy isn't performing well, but at any point, they don't want that trouble. Also, the Chinese are actually quite big on sovereignty, as you may have noticed. The invasion of Ukraine is the most flagrant attack on the principle of the the integrity of all existing borders, which is part of the founding charter of the UN. 
And it's there because we don't want to go to war over this stupid stuff again. And then the Russians go ahead and do it in the most flagrant way. Um, the Chinese don't want to make the Russians an enemy, but they know the Russians are in the wrong. I mean, it's not being run by, you know, ignorant peasants can, who have an ideology can be a real handicap. But being run by modern, sophisticated people who have an ideology, they can work around the ideology whenever they need to. And for things like caring about sovereignty, they do work around it. I mean, I can remember in the 1980s being lectured about the United Nations at the Soviet Foreign Ministry. And what they were telling me was the integrity of borders and things like that. And the Americans don't understand that borders are sacrosanct. You know, because it makes sense. If you're running a country, you don't want to have that distraction all the time. So the Chinese aren't with the Russians on this. They don't want to damage a valuable relationship, but they're not giving the Russians a lot of weapons. They're not trading with the Russians. They're effectively observing the embargo. They're, they are not being put under any pressure to do more than that. The Americans understand that, and that the Chinese are actually doing as much as they reasonably can do without too much sacrifice economically or politically to, you know, sort of keep the Russians at arm's length. So nobody in Washington has any problem with China's position. They're quite happy with it. it yeah, Iran, well, Iran, the, the Iranians are playing a dangerous game because they might really annoy the Americans on that one. And uh, I mean, it, it won't result in, attack, in an attack on Iran, but there are, there are still further ways that the Americans can hurt Iran. You would have thought they'd run out of all of them by now, but there's still a few. There's someone there, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the guy just turned 70, so it's certainly a possibility. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> but, um, uh, sorry, I now forgot what you said. <laughs> Oh, if Putin kicks the bucket. Um, I, he's not, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, sorry, it's a private joke. Um, the, um, the Russians have a semi-imperial system, but without heredity. So, um, who gets the, 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 the prize next, the, the brass ring, um, is basically a question of factions within what they used to call the nomenclatura. The people, it's basically the list of names, but it means um, those who are on the inside, the people who are recognized to have a say in what happens all communists, all senior communists, but they're, they're a special group, the nomenclatura, that's the Russian for it. Um, and the equivalent still exists in Moscow today, though they're not formally or indeed not really communists at all. Um, rather anti-communist, in fact, neo-fascist maybe, but you know. Um, the nomenclatura will make the decision unless there is a military coup. I do not think there would be a military coup. Um, this is not the kind of army that is capable of, I think, of, of doing a military coup for the same reason it's not capable of running a serious military offensive. It's corrupt. It, everybody has something on everybody else. Um, you know, you, you, you could, it, it would be like herding cats to try to line the army up for a coup. Um, but then it would be like, like herding cats to try to get an answer out of the nomenclatura too. So it's not a system, it's a system that is almost complete anarchy in terms of the succession. Um, I mean, you can figure out what, what would be the 10 names, but you can't bring it down to two. 
And uh, there are all sorts of things that could go, could go quite loudly wrong in the short term. Uh, if Putin were to die without a designated successor, Patrushev is the guy who's is an old KGB pal of his, uh, Nikolai Patrushev, Patrushev um, who is the man who allegedly has has Putin's eye. But Putin is in no position to enforce that choice once he's dead. So I don't think it means much. We can probably do one more question because he's well over 70 and he could drop dead. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you that one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can all go home in through the storm. Well, uh, it's my job to thank you all for coming up with that. And I'm really, really pleased that you could turn on tonight because, you know, the weather's not so hot and it's a late start to the talk tonight. And it's been a while since we were doing anything like this. So it's really good to see people come up tonight. So thank you very much. And thank you to the people who joined in online. I'm sure there must have been some people. Okay, uh, thank you to Anna Schutzweg, who is the organizer of tonight's event. The main employee of the Mullen Institute. But of course, uh, special thanks have to go to Gwen Dyer, who uh, has been here a number of times. In fact, we were chatting over at the pub. And I said, I have a picture of you at home on the couch with my, at the time, I think, five or six year old son, who's 38. Yeah. Uh, and Gwen was here to give a talk. And it might have been the Gulf War, around the time of the Gulf War, someone mentioned that. So Gwen has been here several times since then, I think. The horse knows the way. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's really great that you continue to visit us and we all benefit from having you amazingly keep doing what you're doing and keep publishing books by the way when has just published a couple of new books oh i did yes that's right i wrote i wrote one on war which came out last august i think it was and there's another one coming out late this year on climate change so there you go you can buy those and i'll reach it <laughs> Probably a gold ball or something. Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you. Just what I needed. Thank you very much. I'll give you your mic back here. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>